Okay. So earlier on this uh, this week, a couple of days ago, actually just yesterday, I was fortunate enough to give a talk at a, a centre uh, which assists people who have been tortured and have other sort of traumas in their lives. And uh, it's interesting being able to give talks at so many different locations on different subjects. But there's a very nice question which was asked at the end. And uh, it was coming uh, from a person who has a very strong faith. And he was saying that when such things happen, you know, do Buddhists actually lose their faith? And do they um, how do you restore their faith you know, in their religion, in their spirituality, when some of these terrible things happen in life? And you know, do people, those Buddhists, uh, lose their faith? Or do they blame it on karma? What happens when tragedies or traumas or even torture hits you? And you know, as a Buddhist, because a part of Buddhism is not having a faith in a creator God or an all-powerful protector up above somewhere, it makes sort of Buddhism a very different path. I know many people, they, they pray to some divine being uh, to help them, especially when the lottery is coming up tomorrow, some people tell us. Or they pray for other things, and especially in times of difficulty and trouble, sometimes people who go to church or a synagogue or a mosque or even to some Buddhist temple say, I've been going to these places all this time. I've been keeping all the rules, giving donations. Why do these things happen to me? And sometimes people do lose their faith. But as a Buddhist, when these things happen, because we don't put our, our confidence in our destiny in the hands of an external being, we realize that our destiny is in our own hands. And it's a very big distinction between Buddhism and the theistic religions. So instead of saying, you know, please up above there, please help me, and look after me and care for me, instead of putting that fate in the hands of another, that we take responsibility for our fate, for our destiny. And it's something which does distinguish Buddhism. It makes it harder in the sense that, you know, that when you realize that you are responsible for your future, and for your happiness, and from your suffering, from your prosperity or from your misery, you are responsible for that. It puts the, puts the onus straight on us. We've got no one to blame, no one to ask for favors. We can ask other people to guide us and give us tips, but this journey is our journey and we have to take responsibility for it. It's a tough call because people like you know, to have a mother or a father you can uh, go to for assistance. Unfortunately, the real world is the fact that you are in many situations on your own. But it doesn't mean it's hopeless because instead of having a divine force which will protect and guide us, you know, we have our wisdom, our own inner divinity if you like. Our wisdom, our compassion, our understanding of our nature and the nature of this world. And especially that, uh, well, I've already mentioned the Buddhist law of karma. It's also when such difficulties happen to you, it's always not correct to say, this must be my karma. I've had a car accident, it must have been in my previous life. I've bashed into other people's cars. That couldn't be the case. They're only usually invented cars. Maybe you were in a chariot before and rear-ended another chariot. I don't know, but it's very unlikely. So, it's sometimes when people say, oh, it's my karma that this has happened to me. That's specifically stated by the Buddha in the ancient text. You cannot say that. So, when difficult things happen to people, you can't say, it's my karma. Because if you start saying things like that, straight away that you get into the fields of self-blame and guilt. That I'm terrible, I deserve this. And of course, you all know that that is a very common response to people who have been tortured or raped or beaten, who think that I deserve this. Those of you who are psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, carers, you know that this is a common response. And of course that type of response 
uh, blocks healing and puts the healing back for a long, long time. So karma is nothing about blame and thinking I deserve this and feeling guilty at oneself or feeling angry at others. Instead we take responsibility and by taking responsibility it means that whatever situation you are in, you know, we want to find out why this happened and then the most important thing is what we can do about this, how we can move forward. When it gets to actually asking that first question, why do these things happen? And basically the answer is because they can. It's the old Murphy's Law, <laughs> which is I think if uh, Buddhism, if the Buddha had known about Murphy, that would have been in the, Mur in the, <laughs> the Buddhist canon, Murphy's Law. If it can happen, it will happen. In other words, what uh, we understand uh, is that because we're born in this human life as human beings, there's all sorts of things can happen to us, it's par for the course. And the classic tale, the classic anecdote, which when I saw this myself, it opened up a lot of answers to the question, why do these things happen to us? And it was the, the case of this uh, Thai man uh, who was drafted into the army and who went to go fighting for the Thai nation in some border region and he got shot and badly injured and once he was wounded he had to leave the army and he went to see my master Ajahn Chah to complain and to say, why me, why did this happen? It was a bad wound. I'm not sure exactly how he was disabled but it was a serious um, trauma. And he wanted to know why. What karma did he do to be shot? And without any, any hesitation, Ajahn Chah replied, the karmic reason you were shot was because you joined the army. <laughs> now it wasn't being flippant because these great monks you know, and nuns, they're not flippant, they're not just telling jokes just to amuse people. Behind every joke there's actually a message there. Is a truth. And the message was that when you do join an army, you'll be shooting bullets at other people. And so you can expect other people will be shooting bullets at you as well. Most of those bullets will miss. However, some bullets will hit. And you've been one of those soldiers who has been hit. This is what happens when you join an army. And that particular um, scenario was obvious, it made sense but it was extended to the fact of being a human being, being alive in this world. Why did I get cancer? Why did I get heart disease when I've been eating good food and meditating and exercising? Why do these things happen? And it's because you've joined this human race. It's what happens when you're a human being. As I've said before, before you were reincarnated, you should have read the small print in the, in the contract which you signed to get born. It meant, number one, you can die at any time, for any reason, either being hit by a truck, or being killed in a tsunami, or having cancer, or all sorts of other things. You can die at any time. This is par for the course. This is part of being a human being. So what it means is that this is our truth, this is our nature, this is what we've got ourselves into. So we know this is happening and once we're truth about this, we know it can happen. It's amazing just what that particular truth, it's not because of somebody else, it's not because of this or that. We know that this is part of having this human journey. Once we understand that and accept it, we can actually just um, uh, make strategies to know it can happen and that it's not, we're not exempt from these things, then we can do our very, very best to lessen our um, chances of having these tragedies. Once we know it's possible, this is par for the course, then we want to make sure that we reduce the opportunities we have for these terrible traumas and problems. And we can do a lot. And doing something to make sure that we lessen our chances for pain and suffering and difficulty is what the law of karma is all about. So, we're trying our very best. We realize that we do have choices. 
And what we want to do is to make such choices that we limit the possibility of trauma and torture and pain and tragedy. So, you know, we do exercise, you know, we do try and eat well, we do try and do the very, very best, but even so, we know that that's not enough. Sometimes it just doesn't work, that's par for the course. All we're doing is increasing our chances. But it also means, and this is probably one of the most important parts of Buddhism, is that when that trauma and problems happen, we don't think, oh, it was my mistake, it's somebody up there's not looking after me. We don't get into the guilt and anger, because the guilt and anger which comes when a person experiences pain, torture, suffering or whatever, that type of guilt and anger again stops the healing happening. It just makes that pain stay for longer and longer and longer. I remember a couple, not sorry, a couple, a, a family uh, who, this is many, many years ago, so I don't mind talking about this family. She would be a regular at one of my meditation groups. And after one evening, uh, it was actually her friend said, you better talk to this lady because she's in a big trouble. And when I talked to her after the meeting, her trouble was that she found out her husband had been sexually abusing her kids. Uh, the signs were seen at the primary school where her two kids were attending. It was uh, reported to the police. It was investigated. It was true. The father confessed. So there was a real big problem, huge problem for her and her kids. Fortunately, now she was a Caucasian, she was a Buddhist, she had enough understanding about the Dhamma, about the truth, about the nature of life and the mind, to first of all let go of what most mothers would feel at that time, guilt and self-blame. Because that's your kids, I should have seen the signs, why couldn't I protect these people? Why did I choose a man like that? You can understand just how blame is a very easy response to have. I'm talking about self-blame here. But because of all of the teachings she had heard over the years, you know, she realized that this can happen to anybody. She understands that the nature of a mother's love to her kids and also love to her partner was such that we just cannot see the things which we don't want to see. It's a nature of a mind to be often in denial. So what is very painful and hard and difficult, what we don't want to see because it's going to break up our whole life, it's natural that we can't see that. Sometimes we just can't do anything about it. It's just part of the psychology of our mind. It's also the reason why that people break up and many of you have nah, not on your first relationship, you know, maybe some of you have been married two or three or four times, I don't know how many times. I know that Dennis is a marriage celebrant so it's always good business for him <laughs> when he's more, <laughs> more marriages. But it just happens and so many times that when there is a breakup in a relationship, you know, because they come here, they come and ask for advice and it's so often the case that one of the partners come and said, I don't know what the problem was, we're having such a wonderful time. And then he comes along or she comes along and says, you know, it's been falling apart for years, but I thought that we're having a wonderful time. Of course this happens because if you're in a relationship, you love it so much, you're getting so much not just joy but meaning in your life from it, any signs that there's a problem, you just cannot see it, it doesn't come into your mind, it's part of the nature of the mind, you just very difficult to see what is painful for you. So when you meditate, and Buddhism understands this so very well, they've even got a name for it in part, it's called Vipalasa, just the way that our perceptions and our thoughts and our very experience is actually bent. It's even just the first time we experience something, we've already filtered out what we don't want to hear and we've allowed in what we like to hear. This is just part of the nature, the psychology of the mind which was recognized by the Buddha 25 centuries ago. So this poor woman, straight away, she'd understood that. 
that all of sort of the the blaming of herself, she realized she wasn't to blame, she was a good mother, she was a good partner, she was doing her very best, but she just could not see it. And there was a reason she could not see it. Because it was just too painful for the senses to actually to uh, allow in to her mind. So straight away the self-blame had been let go of. And I don't know how many times that I've said here that guilt has got no place in Buddhism. Blaming oneself is just um, allowing the problem to fester and it just gets worse and worse and worse. She'd heard that many times, she understood the reason for that, so she wasn't blaming herself. And of course the next thing was blaming the partner. And of course that's a very easy thing to do, when that person is responsible for so much pain and suffering, you know, to your own kids and to a, a relationship, a marriage you put so much of your time and effort of yourself into, destroyed by this, and it's disgusting. But again, because of her understanding of karma, understanding of the nature of the mind, the nature of happiness, wisdom, kindness, compassion, she was able to let go very quickly of any hatred or ill will towards her partner. We all know that that hatred and ill will, it hurts us much more than it hurts the object of our anger. The old statement that getting anger, angry at somebody else is like picking up a hot coal and trying to throw it at them. Most times you miss, but every time you pick up a hot coal you burn yourself. Every time you get angry at another person, you always hurt, that's 100% true. Sometimes the other person hurts, but most times they don't. But you always hurt. So getting angry at another person, even though it's a culturally accepted response in a place like Australia, people who understand the nature of the mind and the nature of the world realize that anger is just totally dysfunctional, it doesn't help at all. It doesn't serve its purpose of solving problems. So, she understood that very well because she'd been meditating, she'd been exposed to these Buddhist teachings. So instead of getting angry and blaming someone else, she took responsibility for it. Not in a way of anger or guilt. That's not taking responsibility. Taking responsibility means this is a situation we're faced with. Without any blame or anger, how can we move forward? We can't change the past. Anger, guilt is all about messing around with the past. It's obvious to people but sometimes, as I said to someone earlier, we need to come and listen to these talks every Friday night for many years until we get properly brainwashed so we don't need to get in anger or guilt ever again. I know it's so free to realize that you, you know, these things happen and you don't have to follow that path. And so instead of guilt or sort of anger, she let go of that pain. What she did was obviously there's no way she could live with a man like that again. He had to go to jail anyway. The relationship was gone, but she had no anger towards him realizing the anger was not going to hurt him and it was only going to hurt her and her children. She actually let that go very quickly and it was an interesting experience for me because as her teacher she told me later on, she actually wrote to me, she got into herself into another problem but it was an easier problem to solve and that was because she was the mother of the kids that she had to go to counseling it was um, obligatory for her uh, because she'd been in this trauma traumatic situation and they realized that she had to be counseled out of it. F unfortunately, the counselor had no understanding about Buddhist attitudes and so when she came along and said, no I don't hate that guy, I don't want him to go to hell, I don't want to sort of um, murder him or uh, whatever, the counselor thought that she was in denial. Because we all know that you want to sort of uh, string that person up by his, you know, well I shouldn't say what, but <laughs> you know what I mean. 
And this is obvious that everybody would like to torture him back for what he did. Everyone would like to get angry, but they didn't know that Buddhists don't do that. And so when she said that, look, I've let it go, that, you know, obviously that I can't love that guy anymore. I th you know, obviously I think he's just a terrible guy and needs a lot of help, but I'm not going to get angry, I'm not going to have ill will against him anymore. And it needed me to write a long letter to the counselor explaining basic Buddhist principles before she was let out of the counseling sort of roundabout. Because you know, she was in that catch-22 situation only when she admitted there was a problem that she could get released. Because there wasn't a problem, she could not get released. And so she was in that situation, but fortunately the counselor understood. And it was a wonderful experience to say this was a real person in a real trauma who had actually dealt with it in a beautiful way and there was obviously, there was follow-up. Because that was many years ago and even last year I got a Christmas card from the family. They moved to another place. They're doing fine. And that's many, many years. It did actually work. And interestingly, because the mother just let go of anger and guilt very, very quickly, so did her two children. Because you notice how children will follow the lead of the parents. All children want is an example to follow. They've got a natural wisdom, they don't like hating people, but they can learn hate and revenge very easily from their parents. So it was wonderful that that mother could actually forgive. And I don't mean forgiving, uh, uh, sort of approving. Please don't ever think that forgiving means of approving of bad actions. You really disapprove very, very strongly, but the forgiveness means I don't want that person to hurt anymore. Punishment is not my game. What I want is somehow to get that person to learn what they've done wrong, to make sure they never ever do that again. And maybe hopefully they can live a, a good life later on, but certainly to make sure those problems never reoccur. So that's nothing to do with anger or ill will. That's nothing to do with punishment. And that was a beautiful attitude which meant that she could let go and move on. Because every time you want to punish, every time you have this terrible feeling of revenge, every time you think that justice means they've hurt me and I have to hurt them back, that means you're caught in that cycle, you're caught in the past. And some people I know are still caught in the past wanting to punish people who've done terrible things to their family and friends people who have really tortured somebody close to them and because they can't have that sense of understanding of no guilt, no punishment, they can't move on and live a life. So each one of you have had some traumatic experience in the past. What that traumatic experience is means that some of you have heard my joke so many times, I think you deserve to go and get some counselling for torture. <laughs> but, but whatever it is, that sometimes there you have a difficult situation. What we say in Buddhism, that this is the ingredients of this moment. And what Buddhism says, what common sense told me many times, even before I understood Buddhism, this is what you've got to face. Stop looking at the past and blaming why this came and say, what am I going to do with this? And the standard story I'm going to talk to you again with an old simile, the truckload of dung simile. I mentioned this in the talk uh, uh, yesterday. The truckload of dung simile, or let's give it the proper word, when actually this is the title of the, uh, in the American version of my book which somebody showed me again today to be signed. I wanted to call it Who Ordered This Truckload of Shit? But in the United States you're not allowed to say that. But I don't know why, but I've said it here and I often say that word because that's what you say at home and at work. So the truckload of shit simile is that you go home from a wonderful, say, talk at this place or a meal out or you just you know, had a nice day's work, you come home and you discover that someone has dumped a whole truckload of shit in front of your front door. And there are two important things to remember in this simile. And the first thing is, you did not order it. 
it's not my fault. Number two is no one, your neighbors or other people, no one saw the truck coming. So they don't know which organization it was. So you can't ring up somebody to take it away. You are stuck with it. So those are two things about the truckload of shit. You didn't order it, but you're stuck with it. Now, in this simile, there are two things which a person does with a truckload of shit. The first person puts it in their bag, in their pockets, up their shirt, down their skirts, and they carry it around with them. And you find that anyone who follows that uh, strategy, carrying around the shit, they tend to lose a lot of friends. <laughs> You're not very popular. <laughs> and the simile means that sometimes when these traumas and these troubles happen to you, and you carry them around, you get negative, you get angry, you just wallow in grief, I'm just being quite straight with people here, and you keep complaining, poor me, this has happened, yeah it was a terrible thing you endured, yeah we understand that, but if you keep going on with that negativity, poor me, why did this happen? Being angry, being grumpy, being negative, it's obvious that even your best friends, after a while, don't want to be around you. No one likes to be around negative people. It's nature, even the kindest of people, after a while, get fed up. However, there is another thing which you can do with dung, with shit, and that is, and it's hard work, dig it into your garden, around the back. If you haven't got a garden, we've got a nice monastery at Gijigan, a nice monastery down at Serpentine, even over here you can always do a bit of gardening, so any shit, please bring it here. <laughs> We actually just ordered a whole truckload of shit for Bajani. This is our compost mug. We had to go and get a big truckload of shit. Actually, he did order it <laughs> for our compost party in Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, but it's hard work, and it was hard work, sort of, you know, unloading it from the trailer and, and eventually digging it in, digging it in. But after a while, you will find, if you dig in the shit into your garden, your uh, mangoes, apples, bananas, papaya, whatever fruit you have in your garden, is in abundance. And not only have you got many fruits, they are just so sweet and delicious. Why? Because of the shit. And, You've got so many of them, this is an important part of the simile, you actually give it to your friends. You come and give it to the monks and, and the nuns and, and everybody else. You give it to charity. You've got so much and it's delicious. What we mean here is that when you do dig in the trauma and the trouble and difficulty in your life, instead of complaining about it and getting angry and upset and carrying around, you dig it in. What you actually you're growing is this beautiful wisdom and kindness and compassion. And it's not just for you. You don't just eat the fruits. You give it to your partner, to your family, to the friends, to many people. And that's a beautiful part of growing a garden. It's not just for you. Other people enjoy your fruits. And if you've got flowers in that garden, my goodness, they're so fragrant and beautiful. Maybe they may not pass us by and may not be able to see those flowers, but certainly they can smell their fragrance. That's what happens when you've dug in the difficult moments of your life and become a beautiful person, a wise and compassionate person. Other people who pass you enjoy your fragrance because that's what you've grown. The beautiful, wise people of this world they're wonderful to be with, wonderful to see, because what they've made in their garden is for all of us to enjoy. So that's a simile of when we do have difficulties. This is the ingredients we have to work with. And as far as Buddhism is concerned, our law of karma 
is saying that whatever those ingredients is always something we can do with it. This is, shit is one of the worst ingredients. There are many other ingredients which come to you in life. Sometimes it can be wealth, sometimes it can be poverty, sometimes it can be a successful relationship, sometimes it can be the pain of a separation, either being dumped, being left or somebody dying. These are the ingredients of our life. And really it's just how we, what we do with those ingredients. That's what makes our garden. And the great thing is you can do anything with any type of ingredients. And the law of karma says it's your responsibility to work with whatever ingredients you have. Sometimes there is a cause we get the truckload of dung, but sometimes it just happens and we didn't order it. This is why I say it's not our fault sometimes. We can't say it's our karma I got this shit. It's there, okay? We're stuck with it. We can't find out why but certainly we can start digging into our garden. Which means that straight away in a trauma, a tragedy, any negative part of our life, we don't waste time in negativity. We have to get that wheelbarrow and spade out and start digging it in. And it's not that hard to dig it in. We need encouragement from other people, but other people, they can't wheel the barrow for us. They can just cheer and encourage us from the sidelines. They can say when they got their dung and how they dug it in and it encourages us, yes this works, to explain how it works which gives us the incentive to go and actually do it. And as we start doing this we find out there are beautiful results and quite frankly afterwards we thank, thank you for the dung. Thank you for the trauma. Thank you for the tragedy. I wouldn't have had such a beautiful garden. And this is where we find out the meaning of these difficult situations of our life. Because when they happen we always say, why? What's the point of this? Why do I have to suffer? Why me? Why does this happen? Once you have the garden you understand why it happens. Life, if you read the contract before you were reborn, it says that many of these things can happen. And why they can happen? Because they're testing us. And sometimes, and most times, it's as if they are designed just to test us and for us to pass. I was a school teacher for one year and when I was setting examinations and tests I was taught if you're going to set a test you want to sort of make sure that most people get at least sort of 50% but no one gets you know, 100%. If everyone gets 100% that's a waste of time, that's not a good examination. It's just too easy. You know, if too many people fail then you're actually you're getting them dispirited. You know, it's too hard. You're trying to set that standard so most people pass, but a few people fail a couple of questions. So actually they learn just you know, their weak points so they can get stronger for the next examination. And that's exactly the same with life. You know, you have been examined many times. And if life was too easy, if you never had any trouble or trauma, it would be a total waste of time. You wouldn't learn anything. You have a great time. But there would be no, no oomph, no essence, no learning, nothing which really is there for you to grow with. There would be no spirituality. It's one of the reasons why in traditional Buddhist dogma you can't get enlightened up in heaven. You don't have enough to test you. It's just too, not too fine, too nice. And the same if you have too much difficulty, it's just too much pain. You, you, there's just too many sort of wrong answers and you just fail too many times. But in this human realm that you, most of the time you succeed, but a few times you fail. It's just the right level for learning. And so you do have lots of happiness. Most of the time people succeed and have a wonderful time in their life. But a few times you do fail and you do get these difficulties, you do get these, these problems and pains. That's what they're there for, for us to really grow from them. I often say that how on earth can anyone learn how to be generous if they haven't been poor? I don't know about you but a couple of times I've been hungry, haven't ate for a couple of days. Mostly my own fault for going travelling without enough money. But when you have known hunger, real hunger, it's impossible to pass by someone else who asks for something to eat. 
we know how it feels. That's why sometimes fasting is useful. If you go without food for two or three days, doctors may complain, but I'm talking about the spiritual benefit. Then you know what it's like for, say, a person in Haiti who hasn't eat, eaten for three or four days. You know what it's like. And that's only a small thing. Sometimes, if you've been poor, you really had a hard time just paying bills. Then you know if there's any other people who have difficulty, you'll always give them a hand. If you've ever been lonely and suffered, when there's been no one there for you, you know what it feels like. Then when someone comes and asks you for a few minutes of your time, you will never say no, even though you are busy. Because you know what it's like. You've been there, you've experienced those painful situations of life. So sometimes you understand that these are actually learning experiences. You know, sometimes people ask, you know, how do you become wealthy? It's one of the things which greedy people always ask. Or they get more direct as they asked this morning at a, a ceremony in a Thai restaurant. You know, please, you know, how do we see the numbers tomorrow for the lottery? But why are people wealthy? According to traditional Buddhism, it said, if you've been generous, and if you're really given, then wealth comes to you. One of the people I know who won the lottery, but I think this one was in either Queensland or New South Wales, he was an ex-monk. This ex-monk, you know, he was actually he came the first year at our monastery down at Serpentine. He came, but he disrobed afterwards. But he spent a whole year of his life building a little hut for our teacher in Thailand, but a special hut which had other rooms because at this time our teacher in Thailand was very sick. He had a stroke. He spent a whole year of his life hardly meditating, designing and building this hut for his teacher. And a few years later, after he disrobed, he won the lottery prize. We knew this because he travelled all the way to Thailand to give a big donation to the monastery over there. He said, this is why I won the lottery, because I spent a whole year giving, expecting nothing back in return. And I can see the reason why that's the case. It's as if that you are tested. Can you use wealth? Do you know the purpose of wealth? They test you out, first of all, with small amounts of money and see whether you use it on yourself, which is not the purpose of wealth, or whether you spread it around to your friends, to your loved ones, to society, whether you can actually use wealth nobly. And if a person is generous, as if they can just share the small amount of wealth they have with people who need it, their friends, their relations, charity, Buddhist societies or whatever churches. If you do know how to use it properly, then you're given more. As if you've been tested and you've passed. But if you keep it to yourself, put it in the bank, but don't help others. And just turn away from people in need, whether it's people, earthquake victims, poor people, whatever. If you turn away, then it means you don't know how to deal with money. So you're not given any more. I thought it was a beautiful explanation of the karmic cause for wealth. You're tested. If you pass, you get more. Because they know that you're a person who can use money properly. Just a natural sort of law of the universe. And so that if you have you know, had little money, if you have had sickness, if all of these things, once you've been there and you've known it for yourself, you know what it's like to be in deep pain. You just you can't walk past another person who's in pain. You know, sometimes you hear these terrible stories, you know, in the newspapers in places like Perth, about people lying on the side of the road, you know, injured or wounded, and people just drive their cars past. They don't stop. They don't stop to help or look after. Why is that? It's because they haven't known what it's like to be wounded, to be alone, to be poor. Once you've known what that's like, of course you can't walk past. 
which is one of the great benefits of being in those difficult situations of life. The trauma, the difficulties, the problems, we do learn from them. We know what it's like. Compassion and empathy grow as a natural course. We do become far better beings. This is the workings of the law of karma. We learn from these things. These are the ingredients which we have. We work with these, we grow from them, and we become better people as a result, hopefully, if we know the rules of the game. And so as such, it means that we have a, a much uh, nobler and more efficient way of dealing with the problems of life, which do come to us. It means that we do need to see psychologists and psychiatrists less than the average person. That can save us a lot of money. I even remember just one of the traumatic situations which I was in, rec no, not recently, it was quite a few years ago now. For those of you who have been coming here a long time, you know that in, I think it was 1991, January the 31st, we had this huge bushfire which came through Bodhinyana Monastery. I was there at the time. It was a crown fire, the hottest day ever in Western Australia in history at the time, surpassed a couple of weeks later. But to this date, it was the second hottest day ever in this city. And that's when we had a big fire coming through our monastery, trees exploding, and had to be evacuated. And for those of you who remember, we evacuated down to the bottom of the hill on the southwest highway. Well, I don't know if it was Channel 9 or Channel 7, but somebody put a a uh, microphone in front of me with the TV camera running to be interviewed for the 6 o'clock news. Remember when I was on the 6 o'clock news? Also the front page of the West Australian the next day. So, big um, uh, fire there. But the person who interviewed me ran me up a few days later. And I always remember this and said, we want to do a program about you. And I said, why? He said, because look, I've been interviewing people in these tragedies and traumas for so many years, and this is the first time I've interviewed someone who was so relaxed <laughs> when they'd just been through a life-threatening trauma. And I said, yes, being a Buddhist monk, that's just what you like. She said, but I've never seen this before, can we interview you? And actually, for those of you who've been around a while, I said, what was the program? And it was actually the, the Hinch Report, which was supposed to be like such a, a dangerous program to get on. When I asked the people in the committee, they said, no, don't go anywhere near that program, they'll tear you apart or whatever, I don't know, but I refused at the time. But a few weeks later, we got the, some students coming up from Murdoch University who wanted to do a trauma study on us. Because this was a, a trauma, it's like the 2J fires. You know, no one was actually killed, but you know, we came pretty close. And you know, they're asking all these questions. You know, do you have flashbacks? Do you have dreams of fire? Do you have smokes? I said, no, 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 no. And they were very disappointed. Because <laughs> just you weren't trauma there. And he said, because you were a Buddhist monk, these things actually work. Yeah, there was a life-threatening situation and all your things were destroyed, but you just let it go, it's the past. And instead you were focusing on rebuilding the monastery and getting all the infrastructure back in and just carrying on. And those things like that actually showed me that there is a real other way of dealing with the difficulties and traumas of life. We learn a lot about fire safety there. In fact, you know, the local rangers, they look upon us as, as examples, they take other people. I, th I just saw this, I think, in 2004 or something. You now, FISA, this is you know, the Fire and Emergency Service of Australia, they gave us a prize, a certificate. I think it was Michel Roberts at the time, came to present it to the monks at Bonyana Monastery for our, our fire safety stuff. And look, this is actually what happened once. Once the local ranger of our shire decided to do a spot check on us on our monastery, you know, because to make sure we had everything going. And it just so happened that all the monks were in our fire suits, we had the fire things going, we were doing a drill. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. And this rage just said, did you guys know I was coming? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and they were in the middle of a drill and he did a spot check. So, you know, we monks have just got it together. <laughs> 
so that we learn just from that experience, you know, how to make sure our monasteries were safer. So, all of these so-called traumas, we don't sort of look upon these things as as things which hold us back in the past. We learn from them, and actually, a lot of times, we tend to sort of welcome them. It's part of life. Getting shot by bullets is part of being a soldier. You know, part of having a relationship is the difficulties you have with each other where you're really challenged just how strong is your commitment to one another when those difficulties happen. Hopefully you are strong enough to be there to learn and come closer together. Not only learn about relationships but learn about you, how you work and how other people work. To learn how to forgive. Because remember in a relationship you've chosen that person they're special for you. If you can't forgive them, how can you forgive other people, just the ordinary Joes you haven't chosen? So it's a test. Rise to that test. Learn from it. Grow from it. It's amazing just what a person you'll turn out to be. Every opportunity is you have the karmic choice and this is a great thing, it's not the choice of some being up there. You're not a victim anymore. You're not just this idle person uh, who is just being, um, uh, being controlled by some superior being. You take charge there, which means you do have the choices. And this law of karma gives you those choices. The wisdom, the compassion gives you the choice. You have a choice to carry the shit in your pockets or dig it in. You've got a choice to grow or to fester in the past. You've got a choice to build happiness, beautiful happiness, the happiness which is not just based on sort of good luck but which you've earned, which you've built and grown you know, with hard work, I'm not talking physical work, hard spiritual work, you've made it happen. And when you get that type of happiness, that really is the spiritual wealth which you have earned. You really are a compassionate, wise person. You are a great benefit to anybody who knows you, who comes close to you. That was worth it. Sure, you've had a hard run a difficult life, but in those later years of your life what other people may be just worrying about their death, worrying about their superannuation, whether you've got enough to survive, worrying about the stock market, you are not worried at all. You have your spiritual wealth, you built it up. <laughs> I often joke, a monk uh, I don't know, only a few years away from retirement. I've got no super. I've got no shares. I've got no money squirreled away. I've got no assets. Just even this afternoon, I've got one of these healthcare cars for low income. <laughs> <laughs> and I just filled it in today and got our secretary to sign it earlier on today. And it's, I love actually filling out those forms. Because they say just, how much income do you have? Zero. <laughs> How much shares? Zero. How much superannuation? Zero. How much do you get from rent? Zero. 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 <laughs> and it comes to zero. I've got absolutely no material assets. But I'm wealthy. My assets are the spiritual assets. I've got all you friends. You feed me every day. You clothe me. You give me bars of chocolate, so many that I just don't know what to do with. Except maybe open a chocolate shop. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my spiritual wealth. And I know that you know, for the rest of my life I'm going to be well looked after. I don't need superannuation, I've got super karma. <laughs> this is that spiritual wealth, but you've done it hard. We did work very hard and did endure and did do a lot of hard work, and still continue to do that. When those things happen, great, more shit for my garden. And that's such a beautiful way of looking at life. We had the stuff about the Bhikkhuni ordination, 
which I think is, why did that happen? Did something beautiful, you don't, women, what a wonderful thing to do. But when shit comes, thank you so much. More for my own garden. So you can actually grow in more forgiveness, understanding, more wisdom, more knowledge, more spiritual wealth. That's the meaning of this life. So when trauma, tragedy happens, you do have a choice. You're not such a victim. You have an opportunity. And later on in life, if not already, I hope you understand why these things happen to you. They happen to you because the life thinks you can deal with it. You may sometimes think, you can't, it's just too much to bear. Never think like that, you can. If you want encouragement, come and see like monks like myself or my other, other monks or the nuns, who give you lots and lots of examples of people who had it even just worse than yourself, but managed to grow. It's wonderful to see other examples, it can be done, it has been done. It just encourages you that, yeah, I can do it as well. And you dig in a little bit every day. Every day, just one day at a time, one moment at a time. You just wake up one morning, the ship pile is gone. And you've got this incredible, beautiful garden. And then you say, wow, whoever it was who dumped that truckload of shit, thank you so much. <laughs> and that's the talk for this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. So has anyone got any questions about this evening's talk or comments about dealing with trauma, tragedy and problems? Yes, in the back. Okay, you're just saying about when these things happen to you, the question why it happened, is it because it's a test and it's a great opportunity or is it because of some bad karma we've done in the past? Again, I was warning in the beginning of the talk against thinking it's some, the result of some bad karma in a very simplistic sense, you've done something wrong and this is your punishment. I'm now going to be punished because you know, I have hay fever. So sometimes it must have been because I, I must have punched somebody in the nose when I was very young, so I've got a bad nose now. <laughs> and that's a simplistic, and it's a stupid way. You can t tell jokes like that, but it's not really sort of meaningful. So instead, you know, you don't sort of get into this guilt and punishment business. This is a punishment for something I did in the past. Never ever think like this. It's not a punishment, it's an opportunity. So that's what we mean by the karmic thing. If it's a punishment for something you did in the past, again, it opens up this terrible sense of lack of self-worth. I've been raped, I've been physically abused. I must be such a terrible person. And of course, there are many people get into that, that hole of lack of self-esteem, thinking they're a victim because they deserved it. And that's common. It's terribly, unfortunately common that people blame themselves that way. They're not even Buddhists and they still think it's their karma, this happened to them. And of course that is not helpful at all. So that's what we try and sort of brush aside, try and explain away, that is not how it happens. And actually sometimes one of the things they said at this talk one of the useful things about having an authority, having a senior monk, a senior nun, a teacher, is because we have the authority to actually to convince maybe traditional or cultural Buddhists who think that way. You may try and explain that's a stupid way, that's not Buddhism, but they won't listen to you. But you know, when you've got a big monk or a big nun comes along and sits on a high seat in front of everybody and I say it said, oh it must be true, Ajahn Brahm said it's true. So I mean obviously that's a dangerous thing but sometimes you can exploit that to people's advantage. So they don't think in that particular way anymore.
Does that sort of answer the question? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Any other comments or questions about this evening's talk before we move on? Oh, yeah. How do you actually dig it in? First of all, we're talking about embracing it. Dig it into yourself, accepting it as part of you. So by embracing it and accepting it, you find that number one, most of the pain disappears. A lot of times we call this, you know, the word for suffering in, in Buddhism is called dukkha. And very often we call it like double dukkha. So, you know, you've, you've had pain. This, for example, like say so maybe your mother's died. So you've got the, the, the pain of the death and you said, I don't want to feel this way, I don't want to be like this. And call that double. It's the, the physical is the first part of the pain and then the mental is the second part of the pain. You know, I failed my exam. I don't want to fail. Then you're sort of adding to it. So you failed the exam. That's difficult, but that's, you're going to stay with that. Okay, I failed. It's okay. I'm going to accept this. This feeling is okay. So you embrace whatever's happened. So by embracing it, by bringing it in, the fertilization happens. By rejecting it, this is wrong, it shouldn't have happened, or sometimes denying it's happened, is actually keeping it outside of you. Bringing it in, embracing it, being with it, then wisdom happens. Does that sort of make sense? So if, okay. It's very kind of you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting worried a bit there. <laughs> yeah. Embracing, yeah. Not rejecting. Okay, because we learn how what it feels like. When you learn what it feels like, you can see it in other people, and then you can empathize with them. Okay, I think that's enough for this evening, so thank you all for listening.